All right, welcome to this video that I entitle A Brief History of Emergence in the Universe or The Evolution of Everything. After studying the universe for a while, I have adopted a particular perspective on the universe, and that is that the universe is engaged in a tug of war between two different forces, and those forces I call the force of entropy and the force of emergence. Now, the force of entropy, entropy is an idea that came out of the field of thermodynamics. I like to simplify down the idea of entropy to this simple statement that everything breaks and everyone dies. And that is, in a more scientific sense, the idea that ordered systems will tend towards chaos over time. Now in some sense this is a primary force in our universe and if it were the only force in the universe then we would only have chaos about us but luckily the thing about chaos is that chaos does not abide sort of a pure chaotic sense or a pure chaotic state and that's because something that would be pure or perfect is not in, in itself chaotic. Something that is pure or perfect is in its essence ordered. And so what that means is even though our universe is going to be chaotic or over time we should expect that chaos will reign, that within that chaos there will be pockets of order and that those pockets of order will be going in the opposite direction here or the force pulling in the opposite direction. Those pockets of order will be created through the force of emergence. And the force of emergence uh, is very powerful and it's sometimes given different names depending on what field that we uh, operate in. Uh, I, I usually am focused on evolution or biological evolution or cultural evolution, both of which are powers of, are powers of emergence. Um, but if we're in physics, sometimes we might talk about spontaneous order or maybe even self-organization. These are just different terms that we give to sort of the same power, the same force, which at least for this video I will call the force of emergence. So let's begin at the beginning of the universe at the Big Bang. Now at the Big Bang, uh, we at least hypothesize, was an event where a singularity, that is an infinitely dense point in the universe, exploded out with all of the energy and all of the force of the universe. And at that point, the at the point after the Big Bang, the universe was just one big hot sort of explosion. There was just energy flying everywhere. And you can imagine, again, using that uh, principle of entropy, that, that any ordered states, in that case, the, the singularity was an ordered state, would be breaking down and shattering into this explosion of all this energy. And at the beginning of the universe, um, there was only energy spiraling around and, and maybe some of that energy was getting caught up with each other. But as, in some little pockets of the universe, as that energy was cooling down, um, some uh, matter emerged from that cooling energy. And that matter that emerged would be some of the subatomic particles, you know, proton, protons, neutrons, and electrons, as well as other subatomic particles. And then somewhere in that evolution, somewhere in that interaction between those particles, there emerged our first hydrogen atom. Now a hydrogen atom would form when a single proton and a single electron form a stable orbit. Now remember, in some of our exploration of attractors, this would be an attractor state for this complex system. So we would imagine that as an electron goes flying by, goes flying by some proton somewhere, as long as the speed of that interaction was was in the right sort of realm, in, the, in what we might call the attractor basin, as long as the electron wasn't moving too fast, then it might get caught into an orbit around the proton. And so we would imagine that somewhere in the universe, the first sort of atom of hydrogen emerged when an electron and a proton found each other and formed a stable orbit. Well, soon after that, this because this is an attractor, that we would imagine that this state would appear more than once, that more than one electron and more than one proton would find each other, and we might end up getting a lot of atoms of hydrogen forming out in the universe. As, again, this, this energy ball, this explosion is cooling down, we see some of these atoms uh, gathering and, and emerging. Now all these atoms of hydrogen gathered together in a giant gas cloud, and we might imagine that some parts of that gas cloud might be a little bit more dense 
and other parts of that gas cloud. And the force of gravity is going to start pulling our different atoms into that denser center of that gas cloud. Now, the other thing that's going to be happening here, partly because there's rotation already happening within the atom, the atom itself, the nuclei, the proton will be spinning while the electron is spinning around it. That spin is going to cause a little bit of rotation on a macro scale. This giant ball of gas is going to be spinning around, giant ball of hydrogen gas. It's going to be spinning and rotating. And as it does it, the gravity is going to suck it in more and more and more. And we're going to start getting packed in to the center of this, this giant cloud is what we start calling a protostar, or the beginning of a star. The beginning of a star is a giant ball of, of hydrogen being crushed tighter and tighter by the forces of gravity. Now inside this star, at the very center in the core, it's really, really hot because the atoms are, are, are moving very quickly in there. And it's also got a lot of pressure. They're being crushed into each other by the forces of gravity. And all that pressure and all that heat together is at some point we, we cross over an energy threshold where that will allow us to do some nuclear fusion. Now nuclear fusion is where we take an, an atom of hydrogen and another atom of hydrogen or maybe an atom of hydrogen and a neutron and we smash them together and they join into a new atom. If we take an atom of hydrogen and we smash it into a neutron, we just put a neutron in the center there as well, we make something that's called heavy hydrogen or deuterium is usually what we call that. And then if we took two hydrogen atoms and we smash them together so now that we have two protons in the center and we end up having two electrons as well then we end up getting an atom of helium and at, what we end up seeing is inside the center of this star um, the hydrogen that we started with starts getting fused together into helium and some of that helium and hydrogen might get fused into higher order elements like lithium and beryllium and well maybe some of the important ones that we notice are actually uh, show up are carbon and oxygen and inside that star that fusion just keeps happening crushing down crushing down more and more heavy elements are being created inside these stars now as these elements are being created, some of them are a bit more stable than others. Um, a radioactive element, for instance, might decay itself back. It might go undergo nuclear fission, that is split back up into two particles. And depending on the star's mass, um, a number of different things might happen to the star as this happens. As we keep fusing elements together, the core of the star just keeps getting more and more dense, more and more dense. As it gets more and more dense, the forces of gravity get stronger and stronger and, and at some point there's going to be uh, an interplay between the forces of gravity that are trying to crush the, st the st star smaller and the other forces like forces of electromagnetism that are trying to keep electrons apart and so on that, that are trying to keep two things from not being in the same space. When those two forces uh, collide there's two possible uh, outcomes. One is the star could just collapse in upon itself and if it does that um, Sometimes if it's really large, it might form um, what's known as a black hole. Uh, but the other thing that might happen is called a supernova. And a supernova is what happens when a, a, a large explosion of energy happens. And in any case, when a star collapses or when a supernova happens, usually there's a large expulsion of matter and energy from the star. And usually what happens in this case is, you can imagine this star explodes and it just shoots off all of this and all of these this matter that it's been creating in its core. And the heavier matter is going to have more inertia so it's going to fly out a little bit further the lighter matter like the helium and the hydrogen that might still be there might actually just might not uh, fly very far away from the center of the star and then after that explosion usually what we're left with is another gas cloud like what we started with but sometimes we call these gas clouds nebula uh, and these uh, happen after maybe a supernova or maybe a star collapses into uh, a white dwarf, in which case, again, in both cases, a lot of material is shedded from the star and spit back out into space. And in that, and that event might occur more than once. That is, in the center of that gas cloud, another star might form with the, the remaining hydrogen and helium atoms there. And this may occur more than once. Now, uh, we can focus in a little bit now on our own 
planetary system and solar system our own star has probably undergone undergone this type of shedding of its material multiple times and the reason why we're somewhat confident in that is because well here we are on earth where the earth has a whole bunch of these materials these heavier elements and, and and our hypothesis is that they came out of our sun so the only way that they got here is by being exploded out now whenever such an explosion event happens and a reforming of a star is happening you might get something like this this is called a protoplanetary disk and what happens is that all that gas and heavy elements that were were thrown out into, the, into space by the star um, are still, well, some of them are still going to be caught in the gravity of the star. Some might get shot out into space becoming a comet or some inter, interstellar uh, material, but this, some of the material will be captured in the gravitational well and will continue to rotate around the star or orbit around the star. Now, imagine you're sort of a large chunk of, I don't know, uh, rock that's sort of flying around in this dust cloud. If you happen to be one of the larger chunks of rock, then as you're flying through, you might smash into some of the smaller rocks that are also in, in the way. Now remember, this cloud is spinning and it will be spinning in, in, in sort of a, a fixed orbit, but at the same time, it's very chaotic. The, the dust particles in there, while well, the majority of them are spinning around the orbit, some of them might be going the opposite di direction. Um, you know, Some of them might be just as a result of a collision be flying off in, in any random direction. And so there's gonna be a lot of collisions happening inside this, this dust cloud. And, as we'll see, just like the center of the, the star is going to be gathering in that those hydrogen uh, atoms, um, these larger rocks are going to start gathering in the, the smaller rocks, and we might start getting really large uh, rocks being formed, or gas clouds as well, they might not be rocks. And these larger elements have their own gravitational field, and this is what starts to, to build or create our planets. So what we kind of see here is a recursive process where the spinning around the star creates planets, well then also around the planet, the planet itself would be spinning, the material around that planet might be caught in its gravitational well, it might be spinning as well, and we can we know from observing in our, uh, our solar system that a number of our planets, especially the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, um, they have large planetary rings around them, which is at least we could imagine that maybe over another a couple millions of years, these rings might form into more moons and so on. Um, but uh, at the moment, they're still sort of undergoing this sort of emergence of trying to draw that gas cloud, uh, that giant gas and dust cloud into the planetary system. Now, we like to think sometimes that our solar system is, is a sort of stable orbiting, uh, you know, we've got our eight planets, if, you know, or nine if you want to include Pluto in there, and all of them we, we like to think are sort of in this, you know, fixed sort of stable orbit. They've been this way for millions of years, they'll be this way for millions of years uh, from now, and, and that's probably true. The assumption that these orbits are at least stable enough that they're going to last for another, you know, at least my lifetime, I'm not worried about it, but even, even more, you know, a couple million years. However, uh, what this diagram is, is trying to demonstrate is that um, thinking of our solar system merely as the sun and, you know, the eight orbiting objects is uh, very, very restricting and limiting. Um, our solar system is in fact still very much kind of a giant, you know, cloud if you start counting in all of the asteroids that we're aware of, at least in our solar system as well. And that's what this diagram is trying to depict. It's not just the uh, planets, but also um, the asteroid belt. Now there's a very large asteroid belt uh, between uh, Mars's orbit and Jupiter's orbit, and that's just filled with a, a whole bunch of different rocks. You know, whenever we start thinking, I oh, know there might be a, an asteroid that we see coming towards Earth, it's probably come from this belt. And it may have came from this belt either by being sucked in by the gravity of the sun or the Earth or the other planets, or maybe just being knocked into the, in the center of the, the sort of orbiting path uh, by some collisions that may have occurred out there in the asteroid belt, which out there collisions are happening uh, all the time. Another cool thing that's uh, depicted in this uh, image is again, just following some of the cool uh, chaotic uh, 
things that might occur due to the interaction of multiple objects, not just two objects. When we just have Jupiter orbiting the sun, we have a nice simple orbit that we need to consider. But then we, we notice that at least observers or uh, astron astronomers have noticed that in the same orbital path of Jupiter, there are a whole bunch of asteroids um, at these two special points. These are called the Lagrangian points of, uh, of, of Jupiter's orbit around the sun. A Lagrangian point is a special point where the gravitational pull between, in this case, Jupiter and the sun is exactly equal. And as a result, it cause, causes for some objects to get sort of sucked in. It's sort of another attractor point, if you will, where objects are going to be sucked in to that point. Objects that were maybe out here, other other asteroids and so on that were maybe out here probably got sucked into Jupiter's um, orbit and maybe crashed into moons or became part of the, the rings or maybe just crashed into Jupiter itself. Whereas these ones out here are sort of orbiting in the same sort of synchronous orbit around the sun as Jupiter and they're locked in those points because of um, these Lagrangian points again because the gravitational field is or gravitational pull is, is equal in those two points. Now what this image was meant to, to demonstrate to us is that our, our solar system is still undergoing its settling down and its emerging and its, its uh, trying to form a, a stable uh, rotation. And the fact is it probably never will get into something that we would say sort of say the, the final or stable state. And that's because again of entropy that as stable as it might be, it's eventually going to break down. Eventually our sun's going to explode again. Eventually, you know, we may have a, a another asteroid collision on earth or something even more chaotic or catastrophic could happen. Another planet might uh, be sucked into Earth's orbit and, and crash into us. Um, so because of that, um, we should never expect that or we should never think that our current planetary system is in sort of this perfectly stable orbit is instead just stable for now. It has emerged in this state and it is still uh, uh, maintaining itself in this state as long as it can, but the force of entropy is still, for, is still uh, applied upon us and at one point we are going to break down. Now let's focus in on that one planet that we live on, Earth, the planet Earth. And so what happened to the planet Earth is similar to what I maybe just described happening to the planet Jupiter, um, maybe a large uh, rock. Uh, in Earth's orbit or in, in Earth's original orbit was sort of just casting its way through that dust cloud and picking up rocks as it went. So as other smaller rocks and gas clouds and so on uh, got sucked into its gravitational well, um, Earth get, kept getting sort of larger and larger. Uh, the way that sort of gravity works is that if you get large enough, we're going to try and form this sort of spherical mass um, to keep everything sort of even on the, on the outside of the crust. And then also for the first at least uh, half, a, half a billion years of, of Earth's existence, Earth was mostly just a giant molten ball. It just was sort of volcanoes and, and just molten lava on, on the surface, no, no uh, cooled down solidified crust. And that was both because uh, it was, you know, after the explosion of the star, there was a very hot period. It's a hard pot part of the universe. But also uh, all of the regular impacts, um, there, was, there was very regular impacts of asteroids and other objects on the Earth. And that, you know, when an asteroid hits, it creates a big explosion, lots of heat and fire. And so just because of the regular impacts, there was just a lot of magma and fire and, and volcanoes on the surface. Now, during this period, at one point, this is hypothesized, at least this is one of the best hypotheses at this point, is that um, in that early, about four billion years ago, uh, a, another planet that had formed in that gas ball came, um, came tragically close or catastrophically close to the Earth and smashed right into the Earth. It smashed into the Earth and uh, ejected a bunch of uh, state, uh, material into space, as well as probably added some material to the Earth. Um, the, some of that material that got ejected into space maybe just you know escaped uh, the orbit, all the orbits altogether. But some of that material, uh, our hypothesis is, uh, formed into the into the Earth's moon. Uh, and uh, some of the evidence we have for that is that uh, when astronauts returned from the moon um, uh, earlier in the 20th century, they brought back with them some rocks and and some of our geological analysis 
analysis of those rocks is that they are very similar to the, the uh, crust of the Earth. So we suspect that the, the moon itself may have been formed after a big chunk of the crust of the Earth was knocked off as a result of this planetary collision. And uh, we have named this planet that collided with Earth, and we, we named it Theia. Of course, this planet does not exist anymore. It's either merged in with Earth or has become uh, Earth's moon. Now, since that, that catastrophic collision in the, in the four billion years since, um, I believe the first one was maybe between 3.5 and 2.3 billion years ago, uh, we, we started getting life on the planet. And I'll talk more about life here in a second, but the life on the planet, some of that life started engaging in photosynthesis and that photosynthesis led to the release of oxygen into the atmosphere. There was already an atmosphere on the earth, but it was largely not oxygen rich uh, originally, uh, the original uh, photosynthetic uh, bacteria were able to fill it with oxygen and one hypothesis is that led to uh, what is known as Snowball Earth and this is sort of a depiction of Snowball Earth. Snowball Earth is a case where maybe the Earth is, is so cold that it's completely encrusted in snow and ice, even the ocean. This depiction here shows one version where maybe along the equator we got this sort of slushy ocean that's still, you know, not covered in ice, but otherwise the, the whole rest of the Earth was covered in ice. Why this could have arisen could have been due to just climate uh, changes on the Earth, like I mentioned, maybe the release of oxygen, but also due to maybe changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. If the Earth happened to move further out, it would cool down. If it moves closer in, it might heat up. Those types of changes, again, may be caused due to uh, gravitational in interactions with other planets in our solar system. So the reason for this could have been multiple reasons, but it is hypothesized that Earth has probably gone through a number of these uh, snowball periods where the whole Earth is covered in ice. Uh, and then um, some of those periods, we, more recent ones, we call ice ages. They might not be full snow, snowball Earths for there to be an ice age. That just means glaciers have sort of moved further uh, down and, and up from the poles. Um, but this snowball Earth is thought to have occurred you know, a handful of times in the evolution of Earth. Now I want to focus in on the evolution of life. And so emergence, we've been focusing about emergence. All of the emergence we've been focusing on so far has been physical emergence or chemical emergence. And we sometimes call that physical evolution or chemical evolution as well. But usually we use the, we reserve the word evolution for biological evolution. And so to discuss evolution, I wanted to introduce this book, the book on the left by Maynard Smith and Seth Marthy. Um, this book is considered by many to be probably one of the most important books in uh, evolutionary biology in probably the last hundred years or so, maybe, maybe not quite that long. Um, I find it to be a very uh, motivating book as well. It's about the major transitions in evolution. Well, that means the major evolutionary steps that life has gone uh, in its path from, say, simple single-celled organisms or even in prior to that, proto-life, up to, uh, say, human beings and, and modern uh, li animal life form, you know, uh, uh, blue whales and, and insect colonies and so on. On the right is another book that covers some of the same similar material. Uh, this is intended to be more of a, a layperson's read. This one's intended more for evolutionary biologists. So if you are really interested in this material, go ahead and, and grab this book. It's an easy read and it, and it presents a lot of interesting uh, ideas. Now, one of the first major transitions, uh, and I'm going to skip over a couple of the um, for earlier ones, is the formation of single cell bacterial uh, organisms. Even, even single cell bacterial organisms are very complex. They have cell walls, they have nuclei, and so on. And, and so that was one of the first transitions. And then there was also a major transition in um, sort of single cell bacterial organisms from what was called prokaryote to eukaryote bacterial organisms, in which case where some of these sort of cells got together and, and made a decision that let's make a more complicated cell if you will, and that's the eukaryote cell. We're, we are to have eukaryote cells in our, in our body. Uh, and those are cells where uh, maybe a couple of different processes of the cell have been uh, broken down and, and specialized into different subunits of the cell. Uh, there's a nucleus, and for instance, there's the mitochondria and a few other uh, uh, components that were formed again as an earlier emergence in the evolution of life. 
and from that uh, those those eukaryote cells then went further and took that in to say well why don't we form a team and we'll make sort of multicellular life forms that is we'll we'll start forming a single organism that's been being being built out of multiple cells now this idea is going to be very common in all of the major transitions that were identified by uh, Maynard Smith and Seth Marthy is that the uh, usually what you're going to get is something some organisms that were originally uh, individuals that were able to reproduce on their own uh, through these major transitions decide to come together for whatever reason and form an alliance and say hey we as cells are going to work together to to um, you know for our own survival and in so doing those individual cells go through a process of subordinating themselves to this larger organism and at the end of the transition the larger organism is now the individual where those those smaller cells are now fully subordinate they can no longer reproduce on their own they're reliant on the the super organism to to uh, reproduce and and this is this transition has happened many times in um, biological evolution and we just I just sort of commented on two of these which is the the transition from prokaryote life to eukaryote uh, bacterial life forms and then also from single cell eukaryote life forms to multicellular uh, life forms and then this evolution of course went through a couple different uh, phases and, and, and so on uh, we got some plants and, and plants then invaded uh, the land and then once we had plants on land well we also had some animals of course I'm skipping a lot of steps here um, and we got to animals of, of various levels of complexity and the next major transition the next major transition that is sort of still happening in some populations including the human population is the transition from individuals so the same process individuals to a society of individuals so what I've got depicted here is uh, a, a colony of army ants that are uh, on the attack they're marching out to go invade another uh, our colony and these ants uh, most of the ants that we see here are uh, infertile, uh, meaning they cannot reproduce themselves, only the queen of the colony can do so. All of their behavior is intended only to support the queen's ability to reproduce. And so in some ways, these ants um, are in very much similar to the cells that we might have in our hand. They can't reproduce themselves, and the whole purpose of them is to perform tasks for the main organism, which is the colony and the queen. And so this, this is just it, this has happened before in the uh, insect colonies you, we call these the eusocial insects those are ones that have very highly developed social lives and ants are one of the common ones um, depicted here is another eusocial insect not the giraffe the giraffe is just there for scale uh, what we're looking at here is is this giant mound this is called a termite mound this is uh, formed by termites they, they built this um, now, of course, termites are incredibly small, so just imagine for a moment the relative size of this mound to the size of a termite. And again, the draft there just for, for scale. This termite mine mound is larger in relative size than any skyscraper that, that mankind has been able to, to create. And thus, in some sense, termites are better engineers than we are in their ability to build this. And furthermore, uh, the cool thing about this termite mound is not only is it a ni nice, really tall uh, mound for the termites to live in, but it's also completely air conditioned. So you can maybe see a couple holes in there in the side that the, the design of the termite mounds are such that even in the hot sort of uh, savanna sun, um, it's, it remains cool on the inside. It doesn't heat itself up and cook all the termites. Of course, that would be important. And evolution over time has made it so ter termites have been able to do that. Well, again, no single termite is an, you know, an architect. No single termite knows how you know, thermodynamics works and so can manage the air conditioning. But somehow the colony of termites together have been able to emerge as a society. And you can think of maybe that society itself as understanding architecture in at least some way and, and so was able to create this. Another sort of cool um, societies that we see are, are societies of birds. This is a murmuration of starlings. Starlings are a small uh, bird that form very, very large flocks. And when these flocks get together, um, they fly in very interesting and chaotic uh, ways. 
Uh, and this is just another interesting one. And this one I, I happen to like because it's a murmuration of, of birds that happen to have formed a shape of a bird. Um, and that's sort of emergence again, emergence on another level. And then of course, the society that uh, maybe we should be focusing in on our human societies. We've of course emerged here on this planet um, a couple million years ago, the first human, the first modern humans arrived, but only in the last 2000 years have we really uh, ramped up our, our, both our growth of our population and our ability to control the environment around us. And so sort of like the army ants that we saw earlier, this is sort of an army of citizens trying to get to work, um, driving along you know, uh, a road. Well, again, the roads that we've developed and built are, uh, while we think of them as sort of uh, technology, um, well, they mimic things that are, have been occurring in the uh, natural world as well. Now, humans are a very interesting uh, species and a very interesting uh, thing to emerge in the universe. And, uh, and because of that, I've spent a lot of my life studying humans um, and, and trying to understand how, how, why and how are we this interesting and cool. Um, so uh, just to depict some of the cool things that humans have come up with, I've decided to to show this, this is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's depiction of Plato and Aristotle talking about philosophy. This is an example of philosophy, art, and so on. And philosophy, art, psychology, religion, all of these things emerged, again, out of uh, human interaction now. The interactions of humans with one another and the interactions of humans with their environment has allowed us to create all of these interesting cultural artifacts now. So culture is another thing that has emerged. And again, we're getting really high up on the emergence level. We started this talking about the emergence of atoms of, of hydrogen and now we're talking about the emergence of justice and, and religion and so on. And of course, those mimetic particles that were these things that we spread as humans between us uh, these are what we call memes and um, this word meme was coined in the uh, 70s by uh, Sir Richard Dawkins um, but it has been really given a new life in the modern internet age as the meme now is the name of sort of a small thing that you can share on the internet usually that's funny um, and, and spreads uh, virally is another term that we use. And that's because they have, these memes have taken on, at least in some forms, lifelike properties, the ability to spread, uh, spread themselves in the same way that maybe a virus can. That's why we borrow that term. And so uh, emergence, at least a, the tale of emergence is gonna end here uh, at culture and memes is sort of, at least from my human perspective, the highest level thing that has emerged. Um, but maybe other things are emerging around us. And of course, as, as time goes forward, more and more things are likely to emerge. All right. Thanks a lot for following me on this brief history of emergence in the universe. And we'll see you in that next video.